Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure uh, to have here uh, today Dr. Velas uh, Reyes uh, from uh, University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, we will be talking uh, about uh, some of his work in uh, remote sensing and hyperspectral uh, imaging. Uh, Dr. Velas Reyes is uh, George Edwards' uh, distinguished professor at the uh, University uh, in engineering at the University of uh, Texas El Paso. He's also the chair of the department. And, uh, and he's been there since uh, 2012. Uh, he got his uh, BS uh, degree from uh, University of Puerto Rico in 1985 and the MS and PhD from uh, MIT in, uh, in 1988 and 1992 respectively. Uh, he was a member of uh, uh, a faculty member at the University of Puerto Rico in the Electrical Engineering Department from 92 to, uh, to 2012 prior to his moving, of course, to the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, he's had uh, a number of distinguishing, uh, of course, um, uh, positions uh, and uh, uh, associate director of the NSF uh, Research Center at, uh, uh, led by uh, Northeastern. And, uh, He's uh, published quite heavily in, uh, in the area of remote sensing. He's a fellow of IEEE and a fellow of SPIE. And uh, he's also a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences of Puerto Rico. And uh, he was also a recipient of the PKS Award. Uh, from NSF. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks, Hamid, for the invitation and a very interesting visit. Uh, this, this past couple of days, I really enjoyed my visit to the campus and, and meeting all of you, um, many of you, and having an opportunity to, to look at your work and, uh, you know, and maybe explore some interesting collaborations. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to give you a brief talk about some of the work we have been doing in the area of hyperspectral image processing. But before that, given that I come from the University of Texas at El Paso, I usually like to give just two slides of, about us. So let me just go, oh, sorry. So El Paso is right in the middle, between the, in the border of the United States and, and Mexico. So. Um, this is a picture of UTEP, and just for your information, this background here is Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, so we are very close to them. We are basically, if you look at a satellite image of, uh, of the region, we are basically one big urban area. So it's kind of a, a very interesting place given the interactions between the two cultures and, uh, and uh, you know, all the, the issues that have you know, been in the news recently. Now, um, so before we, we start, uh, uh, the, the, about talking about algorithms and, and image processing, it would be good uh, to have some background about what is hyperspectral imaging and some of the problems we, are, we will be looking at. Um, spectral imaging, we can think of it on, in different ways. So we can think of it having a broadband problem in the case of environmental remote sensing. This is the sun. And we have multiple detectors at different wavelengths collecting information about a particular target or scene of interest. Uh, we can think of... Uh, something more of an active system where we have a tunable laser and we are, uh, we are shining over a particular object and again collecting information about the object at different uh, spectral wavelengths. Um, and you know, depending on the way we collect information in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum, we have different modalities. So we can think of a broadband, a single band broadband sensor. We, in, 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 if we are looking at the visible, we call it a pancomatic, but also it's the same for long wave FLIR systems and so forth. We can have multiple samples across the electromagnetic spectrum uh, at different bands. We call that multispectral. That's usually in the order of tens of bands. And then we can have hyperspectral systems. And when we talk about hyperspectral systems, primarily what we are looking at is a kind of a continuous sampling of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum at, at very narrow spectral bands. So it provides a very detailed information about the structure of, uh, of, 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 of irradiance at that particular wavelength range. 
At the end, from the signal point of view, we end up with something we call the hyperspectral cube. And in this hyperspectral cube, what we have is a spatial information. We have information in the spatial domain, but also we, we, we like to think of it as stacking, you know, like a, a cheese uh, slices, stacking the images into a cube where we have in two dimensions, we have spatial information. And in the third coordinate, we have the spectral information. One nice thing is that if you look at a particular pixel across the different bands, you get uh, the signature, and depending on the which region of the electromagnetic spectrum we're looking at, we can be thinking of reflectance or em emissivity data. Um, but, you know, the, the, the important thing from for my point of view is that whatever, when we are trying to exploit this data, we need to find... The, take advantage of the different domains. So we have the spatial domain because it's an image, but also we have the spectral signature, so we have spectral domain. And if we think of sensors that collect data at multiple times, uh, we, we have temporal domain information. Uh, so when we think about hyperspectral, we can, again, we can think of it as an image. We can think of it as some feature vector, you know, in, in each point is a, is a signature, so we can think of it as a feature. We can do all our friendly machine learning, you know, pattern recognition algorithms, or we, it's a physical quantity. We have a spectral signature that has some physical interpretability. So depending on where, what we want to do, we can look at the data in different ways. But, but you know, it's important to understand that the, this particular data set has all these properties, and we should try to figure out how to exploit them together. This is just an example of temporal data we have. This is a sequence of uh, images from a particular scenery in Puerto Rico, but again, you know, temporal information is important and is, is a kind of an interesting problem in these environmental science applications. Now, we're going to focus a lot on the spectral spatial integration, and I just, this is kind of a nice slide that a colleague, Antonio Plaza, prepared once, and it kind of makes the point very clear. So, it, it is customary because we have a point spectra information to try to do point by point spectroscopy when, when analyzing this data. However, you know, just think about it. If we just do point-by-point -point spectroscopy on each pixel of the image, we can just shuffle around things randomly, you know, creating something that has totally incoherent information. But, you know, we can do this per-point processing and come back into the original system and, you know, get exactly the same information. And, and when you look at, you know, we lost the spatial information here, it's missing that if we do just point-by-point -point spectroscopy, we are losing a lot of detail and, you know, a lot of context, a lot of insight about the scene that is being imaged. So, you know, a lot of work goes in trying to explore this, 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 this information by, by many people. Now, when we think about the spectral data, we can think of it in different ways. One is already mentioned is the idea of point as every individual pixel as a single spectral signature. We can think of this as some three-dimensional number array, or we can think of it as some sort of vector value function uh, uh, and each way of thinking of it provides us different contexts to do signal processing and, 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 and analysis. So let's look first in the spatial context, and we are, we are focusing on a particular problem, and if time allows, we may be able to look at some of the other work with, with, where we, are, we have been doing to do some spatial spectral integration, but let's focus first on hyperspectral mixing. Hyperspectral mixing is a problem of interest for the... For the uh, remote sensing community because when we put a satellite on a, 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 a hyperspectral imager on a satellite platform, there are some natural trade-offs because of the limitations of resources, primarily the fact that if you have, you can have either very high spatial resolution or you can have high spectral resolution, but it's hard to have both. So for instance, this is an example with a multispectral sensor, four bands and one panchromatic band, and, you know, this is a standard product that you create using what is called pan sharpen, so you can create a nice color one-meter image. This is a reef in southwestern, southwestern Puerto Rico, and this is the same reef image with Hyperion, which is a hyperspectral imager that was on board EO-1. It's, it's a NASA satellite, and this one has 220 bands, but we have 30-meter resolution. And the idea of doing the spectral high spectral resolution is that you can look at many other characteristics of, of, of what's happening on the ground beyond just having a nice looking picture for, for, for interpretation. You know, people in biology like to understand, you know, how the, the, fun, the behavior of, of, of the plants they are looking at, they like to try to predict things like productivity and so forth. So having the additional spectral information is very important for many natural processes. So 
the idea is, however, in a 30 meter picture, you have a lot of things happening. So the idea is how can we extract information of what is inside that picture, taking advantage of the additional information that is provided by the, by the spectral domain. So the simplest way to look at this is called, was given by this, this so-called linear mixing model. And in this case, what is a very simple idea. So the, whatever is in the pixel, the measure, you know, whatever we measure is kind of a composition. It's a linear combination of the, of the spectra of the materials that are inside that particular pixel multiplied by the fractional coverage of those pixels. So it's a very simple idea, and it's actually widely used in the, the, in the community. You, you know, people are working in more complicated, nonlinear approaches, but they lead themselves to very complicated, to more complicated models with a lot of interesting issues. But this is for many applications that we are interested. This is kind of a working model that provides useful results. So, you know, when we look at the details, you know, the, the main characteristics of the linear of this data is that pixels are, post, you know, are reflectance, usually, when we are, uh, reflectance are positive numbers. That will be an important thing. And the other part is that the fractional abundances are basically positive and they sum up to one. They are area, you know, fractional area coverage. Now, we are, we are dealing with some of the geometry just to have a common language here. So we're going to call E the matrix of n members. We are going to call the, you know, we, from linear algebra, we know the, what is the range space of a matrix. The cone is the uh, particular geometrical object that is formed by the positive combinations of the columns of the matrix. And the convex wall is just the positive combinations where the coefficients are, are up to one. Now, when we think of a picture of a convex hull, you know, we can have our 3M members. It, you know, it's a nice picture. It looks like the triangle. And what we are saying is that, in a way, if, if the number of materials in the image is if it's a finite number, and every, and, every other, and every pixel in the image is inside that convex hull. And that makes an important assumption, because if you think about the mixing problem, as we will see later, it's an ill post problem. So this geometric assumption is very important in being able to get something out of the, out of the data. There are some complexities. I'm, I'm not going to be going over that, but basically we have to be able to do a mixing and get data to reflect that. We have to do a lot of processing and calibration before that. Now, so we already mentioned a mixing is the idea that whatever we mention is a, so, sort of a combination of different members multiplied by the fractional area coverage. What we're interested in is some mixing that we are given this measurement and we're trying to figure out what's inside, the, particularly the spectral signatures of the materials, and then, you know, what fractional area they cover. Uh, clearly, that's an ill-posed problem. So the, the, all these assumptions we are making are the ones that are giving us constraints to be able to solve this problem. Clearly, if we knew the end members, and this is not a totally crazy problem, you know, people use end members from, from spectral libraries or from field spectra if you are collecting uh, data, I mean, if you're collecting field spectra coincidentally when the image acquisition occurred, you, you can use that. And once you know the M members, you know, this is just a, a very simple linear constraint, linear least squares problem, nothing particularly complex there, been solved multiple, multiple times. However, our interest is, is to be able to take data where we don't have any field data and basically go from the image and be able to say what is, is inside the image and you know, meaning the number of M members as well as their signatures, and then be able to predict what are the fractional abundances, you know, the area coverage of that, the distribution of that particular material in the scene of, of interest. So there are several problems. One, we need, you know, obvious ones. We need to determine how many M members are, are there. Uh, you know, their spectral signatures. So we, we, this is kind of, if you look at the geometry of this, this is kind of related to the positive rank of that particular matrix. And then, you know, um, the one, one difficulty that makes it a little bit different from other source separation problems is the fact that we have this particular sum to one constraints, which means these things are not linearly independent in a way. So they are dependent. There is a linear dependency in this. So the geometry is very important because if you think of this as a data cloud, you know, the idea is in a way we're trying, when we're trying to find the end members, and this is the idea that many algorithms for end member extraction explore based on geometry, is the notion that the end members somehow are the corners of this simplex. So the basic idea is to just to search for those, those corners. There are multiple ways you can do that, you know, but that's basic, the basic principle that, that people are trying to follow. So 
Then, you know, this is typically solved in a two-stage manner, so these corner search algorithms will extract you the end members, still finding how many, you know, it's a tricky question, it's a very, it's a hard question still. And then once we have the end members, you know, as I mentioned, getting the abundances is a simple, least constrained, least square pr problem. You know, many people have written surveys about this, so I'm not going to uh, uh, go over all of the glorious details. So now, what is interesting, again, is the idea of a spatial spectral integration, because scenes are not totally, you know, when you have a scene, it's, in a way, it's not a totally random thing. So, you know, we like to think of the nice triangles filled with data, but actually things don't look like that. So if we look at just a very simple scene where we have a background and some two objects, and they are mixed because of the different processes of the image acquisition, what you get there is something that doesn't look like a nice looking triangle, and you can think of all the complexities of variability and noise, and the picture just a little bit more complicated, but you don't have a nice convex object, you have kind of the union of two convex objects. And this idea is kind of interesting, the question, because if we impose this union of convex holes as a kind of a constraint in our problem, we get better models, but the problem is how do we find each piece of the convex hole? So it becomes a kind of a, it complicates our life a little bit, but if we are successful, then we, we get a, a better model and it's more robust to noise variability and other, and other things. Now, so our goal is to develop unsupervised methods taking advantage. And, you know, again, the idea is to explore the spatial spectral structure, so in a way we put further constraints in this ill post problem and hopefully we get a better model out of it. So let me show you some, some scenery. This is a very large image, so we are just intentionally focus on a small, small portion of it because it's kind of interesting. So this portion has, a, this is, I think, is some sort of oops, parking lot with some soil ar around it. These are different kinds of vegetation. This darker finger is just shadow. It's a shadowing effect. So if you look at just a projection of that's a 200 bands image. So if you look at the projection of that image in two in the first two principal components, um, we do that because they basically explain 98% of the variability. It doesn't look like that nice triangle or something even remotely close to that. It looks like a, you know again this idea of the pieces of the of the convex. So this looks like some somewhat convex thing, this looks like somewhat some other convex thing, and this one also do that. So what is interesting is that if we cut and we did this by hand, we just, you know, manually did that, put a line and cut that plane in, in, in pieces. Let me show you what the blue highlight is. So, you know, we can see that the first, in the, the top part is just the, that lot. The second part is the region around the lot. And then the third part is just the rest of the vegetation in that image. So it kind of makes an interesting concept that whether or not we, by looking at the spatial domain, doing some sort of segmentation, not very intense, labor-intense segmentation, we could get the pieces of the, of the convex hole. So this is what we are we're exploring as a simple idea. So get some sort of segmentation, perform this end member extraction on each piece of the, hopefully the segmentation will get the pieces of the convex hole, then we do the end member extraction, and you know it's just from there it's just standard mixing and, and whatever analysis comes after that. Now we did that. We took the three pieces and we did the the, the convex analysis. So these are the different signatures there. Uh, for those of you with more spectral experience, this is just your standard. You know, they, this is just vegetation with the green bump here and then the near infrared bump. So those are vegetation related, and this is more like soil and looks like soil, basically. Um, we did this, you know, did, we solved all this just by hand. We didn't do some sophisticated numerical analysis. Now, well, going back to the cloud, it's kind of interesting to look at the regions where the different M members came to be. So, you know, they're kind of in the corners, more or less, and they are in the transition. Remember, this is a projection of a high-dimensional cloud into two dimensions, so some of the corners may get projected into interior points, but, you know, it kind of looks like what, what we expect to look like in a, in a way. Now, we did the clustering. So what happens is that when you do this partitioning, there are things that are shared between regions. So the idea to minimize that is just cluster things that look alike. It's a very it's a simple idea, so we cluster them. So more or less, this is the result of the clustering. And um, you know, we, we, we get out five different classes that we, because we have ground truth about the classification, although this is not exactly a classification problem, we can more or less label 
the results with different types of ground cover in that particular image. And these are the five ground covers that we were able to identify. Um, you know, we get the abundances using constrained linear least squares. And this is the result of that analysis. So, uh, you know, one of the problems with mixing is that we don't really have ground truth. You don't know exactly the fraction and, you know, the, this model is not a perfect model. So validating these results is not a trivial task at le at, unless we try simulated data, but then simulated data doesn't have the complexities of, of the real data. So, you know, if you more or less gu guide yourself by the color, by the classification map, so, you know, these uh, correspond more or less to the gravel field. This is some soil field around the gravel field. This is, uh, I think, grass field. So it, it more or less looks like the, 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 the expected classes in that particular data set. So we compared the idea with other approaches. So, you know, a very simple approach is just, it's a small chip, so we can just do a standard and mix it on the entire image and do no segmentation. So we do two things. We put in the same number of classes, so we find five end members because we found five end member classes. And then here are 12 signatures, so we run the algorithm with 12 signatures and see whether or not this additional constraint of the spatial information does a better job. And when you look at it, um, um, we think it does in a way. So, you know, there are classes that are easy to identify and they, they show up in whatever you do. You, you, you cannot go wrong with them. But as I mentioned, vegetation looks like vegetation. So different kinds of vegetation, they're just minor variations on kind of a general trend. So in that case, what we have is that these are the three vegetation classes that we did a good identification. But when you look at the other approaches, they, you know, some of them may come up better than others, but there's some mixing between classes. And here, there was a one class that the clustering could just lump everything together as a single vegetation class. So that's, that's the, 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 the idea. The spatial, and it's, this is not a surprising idea because, you know, people who are, you know, basically what we have been doing is just look at smaller segments in the image and we're, cap we're able to capture small features that otherwise if we just look at the global picture, we miss them. So it's not a particularly surprising result. But what is interesting is to, to look at the cloud because in the cloud we can see what happened. In a way, uh, you know, this is the, the, uh, the cloud with, this, with the spatial subsetting. Uh, but when we look at the, the, the blue points here, are the five M members, so they are kind of related to the other M members. But then when we look at the one that tried to do the 12 N member fitting just at the entire image, uh, it turned out that we actually fit a lot into the vegetation part of the thing, which is what, ex what is expected, what, you know, what we expected to happen. So it, and, and, and if you look at that image, that image is mostly vegetation. So the fitting goes to what is the dominant object in a way on, on that image. So the additional structure that we impose because by doing the spatial subsetting and all of this kind of help us to get a more, a better description, I think, of the, of the region of interest. Now, if we try to do that in a larger image, we, we went with NMF to do it interesting, I guess. Uh, so we went to the full image. And it's kind of interesting, the results. So we do exactly, we follow the same idea. In this case, we use a simple segmentation. So we just use quad three, which is something easy to do, nothing particularly complicated. We just partition the image in, in uniform squares, more or less. We uniform, we measure it using some entropy type of measurement. Uh, we like this image because we have some great ground truth. Again, ground truth is not a trivial task in, 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 in remote sensing things. And we apply, we, we compare it with like just applying NMF to the entire image. And again, results are, you know, kind of in the same story. So when we do the segmentation, this is a, we stop at, at tiles that are 64 by 64, not to keep doing it too complicated. Uh, or that the, the whole tie has an entropy that was 90% low, about 90% of the entire image entropy. Uh, we use, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, we use the constrained version of the NNF. The only difference is that we add the sum to one. We have some less than or equal to one because topography adds a factor that is a cosine of a factor between the angle of the incident and the normal to the surface. So the easiest way to account for this is just make the sums the abundances to be able to add to less than one in the case the surface is not totally aligned with the, with the you know, the, angle, the view angle is, is, we have a view, uh, an angle with the, with the view where the sensor is looking at. So these are the M members on each 
that we, we did this we did this intentionally not thinking about being very efficient computationally so we wanted to be very thorough so we did the this is the fitting of the error curve on each tile and we look at the knee of the curve and use that as our estimate for the number of M members this is a lot of computation but you know we wanted to be check if these things may or may not work actually so at this point we were not thinking of computational efficiency uh, we got a total of 181 spectral M members extracted from when we add up all the M members from the individual tiles. Uh, we did clustering, so they are clustering 11 classes. We used MATLAB tools. We, we were not particularly fancy on the clustering approach that we wanted to use. And the, uh, however, you know, we, we did this totally unsupervised. We got 11 classes. The image, according to the ground truths, have 14 information classes, some of them are really, really very small, so very hard to find in the, in the image. And this is what we get. So in, again, validating is not trivial here. So what we did as a way to do validation, we compare our abundance maps, and blue is, is zero, and red is one. So these are numbers between zero and one, with the class map that is a binary map. And more or less, we hope that there is some, you know, there is some correlation between what we see in the class map and what the abundances say. So these are the different classes. And, you know, it looks relatively similar in terms of distribution. Um, also, uh, when we look at the spectral signatures and we compare to their publication, published results, they don't give, we don't have access to the actual values, but these are the average signatures they publish on their paper. You know, the shapes is the only thing we can actually compare here. They look alike in a way. Um, also, um, you know, we do that for other classes, even smaller classes, we were able to get them, which is nice because those are the difficult ones. And sometimes your main interest is to find that small little thing that looks different from the rest. And, you know, so, you know, and it's, it's nice. We were, we got things that we have no clue what they were either, you know, so we put it on, I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it's an interesting result. And the point here is that I was at AFRL that summer working in, in a, one of these faculty fellowships, and, you know, they were doing a lot of work to get this ground truth, put together a lot of GIS maps. You know, we did this with a couple of hours of graduate student times, which, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting idea that we were able to do this on supervised. Now, these are classes that we didn't get. Uh, um, you know, so one of them is very small. This is vegetation. Get confused with other vegetation types. And shaded vegetation, I don't know why, because this is actually a very distinctive signature compared to other signatures. Now, if we did a global algorithm and we did exactly the same approach, we used the L, L, you know, the knee of the curve method as a way to estimate how many M members. Uh, it turns out that in this case, there are only five, according to, the, to using exactly that approach. And these are the five signatures. So you get a big lump of vegetation. You know, you get this one. And, you know, let me just compare the other results. So the idea here is that, you know, the, you, just to compare, this is a vegetation cover that came up in CNMF. Uh, but these are, you know, by looking at the areas individually, we were able to extract more information about different types of vegetation, even one that we are not sure what it is. And so... Same with uh, this one. They, when they are together, they kind of refer to the same classes. But what is the nice here is that this is actually can be mapped directly. You know, if you sum this up, they will pretty much give you the same sum of this together. But when you look at the individual maps, these are more. We can relate these to classes that are declared on the particular image. Now, and you know, they're ones that we actually got pretty similar results. You know, for this uh, grass field class. We have, you know, by the way, we have used this in some interesting problems. We were looking at, for instance, this is a biodiversity grant we got from NASA, and this spatial subsetting, we use it to, to analyze the temporal series of images and, you know, you know, just details here. Not all the data is good because, you know, you're in the tropics, so there is a lot of clouds, and optical sensors don't like clouds, basically. So when we do, we, 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 we were able to, particularly in 2008, found, find a nice group of images that were quite clean, and we use them for the analysis. And these are vegetation mapping of some of the vegetation dynamics uh, across different months. These sensors roughly, well, 
But EO allows us to, to do off, off nadir imaging, so we have actual images every two weeks, but normally, if you are just straight down, it's about once a month, roughly. So now, you know, we get this uh, data set. It's kind of an interesting data set. So we did, this is an example just for the vegetation coverage. We did a bunch of M members, but we are looking at the vegetation for, for some reasons because the biologists in our team were interested in looking at vegetation dynamics for that particular site. We correlated it with some more standard measurements, the NDVI, which is widely used for, for vegetation, global vegetation mapping because it's a very simple feature to compute. Now, you can get the, the trends in both are similar, and you know, you can correlate this directly to, to rainy season. So in that particular area, uh, spring is dry versus fall, which is a more humid, summer to fall is more humid. So you can see how the vegetation covers follow the same trends in a way. However, the, the nice thing here is that this is allow us to be more specific, you know, go into more, exploit the spectra to be more, to have a, a map that actually maps, better maps the, that particular vegetation cover. And, you know, people who are familiar with NDVI know that NDVI have multiple defects. So it's useful, but, you know, you, you need to take it with care. Now, so, what time is it? Do I have time to do this? What time are we finishing? Uh, we have time, so we have 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes? Okay, so let me just do this in a way a little bit faster. But, you know, I, I think it's a column, I think it's one of the, it's a very cool idea we, we did. So we use PDEs, and in that case, when we are looking at PDEs, we think of images of surface. In the case of hyperspectral images, we are thinking of vector value surfaces. So, I mean, it's a, it, and PDEs are being widely used by, in the, by the image processing community for multiple things in, in imaging and pre-processing and enhancement and so forth. So we wanted to apply this to look into the different aspects of, again, this type of data, but these type of data have some particular ideas. So I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but, you know, we were thinking, looking into problems of coherence enhancement and edge enhancement. So remember, this is, uh, this is the image. So if you do edge, edge, coherence enhancement, you're kind of enhancing the flow structure, and in some applications that's useful. When you're doing edge enhancement, you're kind of uniformizing areas, so you have you know, like for classification, that's a great pre-processing stage. So we were trying to do this for, 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 for hyperspectral and multispectral data. This is just some ideas for, for that. But, you know, this is a, a field that is a agricultural field. So you only have square things. So, you know, uniformizing it, you know, edge enhancement is nice. So you can do classification here. But this is like shale, chains, chains of cell collected with a hyper, multi, hyperspectral microscope. So we were trying, they were trying to enhance, you know, they were actually trying to do cell counting. So our idea is we can actually make this uh, flow structure uniform, subtract them from the image, and then count the cells. It was a very, it's a clever idea that, that my students have, not, not me, I'm not that clever. So, you know, but the interesting thing is that you can do diffusion in, in these vector value images, and one could be tempted to do it one band at a time and then to put them together. However, that's not a clever idea because you're lo losing a lot of uh, correlation across bands. So what we're trying to do is we are, we're trying to do diffusion here. So the, diffu the, the, the direction of the diffusion is controlled by a tensor matrix, which is a function of the, of the pixel data. And we are using the same tensor for all bands. So that is how do we capture the information on edges across all the bands. So, you know, if you don't do that, if you process each band individually and then try to put it back together, you know, you take each band and then process as a single image and then build back the cube, you get a lot of dislocation and things that artifacts that are not good for your analysis. But if you do it in a vector way, thinking of it as a vector value function, it gives you better results. So, you know, how do we do this? Well, you know, we sum the... This is a dissension structure tensor. Basically, it is not computed. You know, we have this. You integrate in a neighborhood around a particular pixel, and you get a positive definite matrix. And looking at the eigen decomposition of that positive de definite matrix, you get directions of great change or constant. So you, you can go either way. Now, how do we do that for something that looks like I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of things because I don't have much time, and like any good professor, I prepare more slides than I could go over. But this is the idea. So, you know, the classical structure tensor, they just take the average of all these uh, tensors. It's one way to do it. However, something interesting happening. We, we propose an idea that we need to wait 
the, the, the edge information on each band individually. And why do we do that? Well, you know, there is a, a, a very good reason. So if you look at, this is, a, we're browsing through a hyperspectral cube here. You look at the edges are not the same on all the bands. So we cannot weight the edge information uniformly across the, the different bands. Let me run that again once more. So if you go through the movie, you can see that the edge information is different. And, it, you know, water in particular is a tricky thing because penetration of light in water is high in blue and very little in red. So when we go from blue to red, we get to see some of the underwater features that we are not able to see on the, in the IR images. So, so not all the bands have the same edge information. So, you know, but let's, let's, let's go to something simple. If you, that, those are two different bands from that, uh, uh, from that agricultural field image, and you can see they are not, they don't have the same edge information again. So we were thinking of how to do this, so we de devised some ideas so, to do this analysis. So, you know, if we plot the gradients, you know, we just take the, we just, uh, differentiate with respect to x and y on each band when we just we didn't do any spectral differentiation this is just spatial information um, you know we, we plot it as a function of wavelength you can see that in theory i mean i think if all bands have the same edge information we will see more or less the same value of gradient across the different bands so you can see that they are they have different information so the idea is how do we weight this in a way that is useful for the diffusion so you know a very simple result was that if you look at the zero crossings of the second derivative of a function, they kind of associate with, you can associate them with points of grade change. So we use that and as a way. So we define the following weighting, which is just exponential of the second derivative, and normalize it so it looks like a sum to one weight. And it's kind of a neat trick because uh, at the zero crossing points, this is one, and, and, uh, and everywhere else is less than one. So it's a nice way to do it. Now, um, the, so, the, again, the derivatives are in a spatial dimension. We use some fancy filters, differentiation filters to do the differentiation in a way that is not too, too noisy and so forth. So, oops, sorry. So this is the idea. So, you know, this is just how, how it works. So we have the gradients here. We, this is our three pixels, so we multiply by the weights. This is the weights come up. But notice that the weights emphasize the regions where you have changes in the gradient. So it's, and you multiply this by this, and you get these weighted gradients. And then you do the summation across bands and, and add them up. Now, once you have that, that the structure tensor, you can use the eigen decomposition. These are the directions of maximum and minimum change. We keep them, but then we, we play with the eigenvalues in a way that which part we want to emphasize. We want to emphasize borders, so we want to emphasize uniform structure, and that's what makes the difference between coherence and, and, and edge enhancement. Now, this is, this is just functions we, we propose to do the, the eigenvalue selection. I can provide you the papers and details if you want to know all the technical details. But I think the results are quite interesting because we compare the uniform weight versus the, the, the spectrally weighted. And so this is the, I think, uh, you know, this is the image across different. So this is spectral weight and this is uniform weight. And I think this is kind of an interesting image because one of the problems with some of these moving algorithms is they wipe out small features. You don't want that. So I think this, this particular region on that image is kind of interesting. It has like a lot of spatial structure on it. And, you know, if we go through the uniform weighting, you kind of wipe it out a lot. But if you keep sort of the, uh, the, the spectral weighting, it's doing a little bit of a better job in terms of keeping some of the structure and uniformizing things that look uniform, more or less. Now, this is, it actually, that it, you know, I'm intentionally showing this because this is probably one of the most significant images. But in other images, like the fields, it really doesn't make that much of a difference, the, the approach. But, but it's interesting. And, and in some images, other images, you know, if we look at the gradient per se, this is just a plot of the gradient. It's kind of interesting. This is the, the uh, actually, this is the one, one, the, ele the one, one element of the diffusion tensor. So if you notice here, this one kind of shows you this area is more or less uniform, so it shows up as a uniform area. This is the area with a lot of texture. Here it doesn't show that much structure, while here, which is the weighted, spectrally weighted tensor, more structure is, is captured by the, by the tensor. So, so it's interesting. For instance, we can do many things with this diffusion. So this is a, a, an interesting comparison because a simple way to do the diffusion is just 
some diagonal, keep D to be a diagonal matrix, which is like Perona Malik's approach in a way, the nonlinear diffusion, and just wait, have a weight that depends on the gradient. So if we do that, you know, we pretty much makes everything look uniform in this teacher we are trying. This was something we were doing for explosive detection, so small traces of things are important. They are barely distinguishable in the, in the picture, but this is actually olive oil, so no, nothing harmful about olive oil. But, you know, but the interesting thing is that we are able to, you know, and to do detection, you want to reduce clutter, enhance what you are looking for. So the idea here, for instance, is, you know, we, the big things clearly are not wipe out, but the small things here, they're wipe out. Why we, we still get to keep them here and, you know, try to do, hopefully, if we apply like an anomaly detection or some target detection algorithm, they will be able to perform well there. Now, this is the coherence enhancement data. Again, the idea of the coherence enhancement is just to enhance the flow structures. And, you know, this is kind of, the, of, of something that we were looking at. I think this is not the best one, but, you know, the idea basically, this is cell change, and by, we wanted to enhance the flow structures. So this is doing a little bit of a better job to the flow structure. I think the other image shows it, it better. Some of these things are sometimes a little bit subtle, but, you know, this is an image. This is just the average of image. We take all the bands and average them out in a little bit. So notice that the contrast here for the flow structure is not as big as when we compare to this one. And this is very important because the basic idea is to take these smooth images and subtract it from the original image, and you want to get out the, the borders of the cells. And the people who were doing the cell counting, they were interesting. So these are the results. So this just shows you the results with the typical structure sensor. And this is, I mean, the, the average one. And this is the spectrally weighted structure tensor and you know we, we our results at least from the point of view of the problem of cell counter counting were, were a little bit better and this is just showing you how this is a ratio of the number of objects with certain area number of pixels versus the cell counting and normally the co the, the uniform structure is producing a lot of small object objects uh, that means either cells broken they're not made contiguous by the by the approach and, you know, in general, we were doing better by, by our approach, so it, it helped in the, in the cell counting application. Now, some final ideas is that, you know, this idea of, of this spatial subsetting segmentation is, is, is interesting for the problem of clustering. We're still struggling with the idea of whether or not to identify the, this convex union of, we're thinking of, you know, if you think about it, we are, we're, we're thinking of our mixing of trying to find the union of convex holes of these convex structures in, the, in this high dimensional space. So we're thinking of whether or not doing the spatial segmentation or trying to figure out a way to do it in the, in the feature space may work. We, we're still struggling with that idea. Um, but, you know, something that is interesting is, again, hyperspectral data is, has spectral. Spectral has meaning. There is meaning, physical meaning in this data. And even though we just found some simple way to account for that meaning, in, in the case of doing the spectral weighting, it helped a lot in terms of doing the image processing without having to do a very complicated model in a, in a way. We, so in, and this is something we are trying. If you look, the, both ideas are how can we bring some of the, our sem, physical understanding, we call it like a semi, semi-physical model, into the way we look at the signal. So when we de, use the standard signal processing approaches, they produce results that hopefully are, are more meaningful. And I think that's kind of the philosophy we are trying to, to follow. Um, something that we're interested in, and we haven't taken a crack at it, we, I just, we just got a, actually we got a 16-channel multispectral video camera. We want to play with it and see what interesting things can be done. But is this idea of spatial, spectral spatial temporal signatures, whether or not we can st the extract signatures that go through the three domains. And, you know, a very simple example is uh, agriculture. We know that. So something happened in summer, something happened in spring. So if you look at the scene constantly, you have some signatures. Can we characterize other processes in similar manner just from the data, doing these uh, signal separation algorithms that take data in the three domains and hopefully give us some interesting clues. And, you know, uh, this is the end of my talk. As usual, we thank the people who give us money to do this type of interesting problems. And this is my, my contact information if you want to continue on, on this conversation. Thank you. All for, for coming. Hopefully, it's because we are all excited. <laughs> um, the
hyperspectral imaging information is um, normally just the magnitude of the of the energy in a certain band. Is that right? Most of their their current commercial products are basically just intensity. However, there are some interesting ideas of people pro proposing pol sensors that collect polar polarization information. Polarization, yeah, that's interesting. I was I was thinking also about phase. Okay. Uh, if you were doing um, uh, in, if you were doing um, measurements in the radio part of the, of the spectrum, uh, you could imagine um, getting the not only the intensity but the phase of the signal in a narrow bandwidth. Um, I suppose I can imagine that optically also, although it would be more more difficult technologically. Yeah. But uh, is, is, is that something that even, I mean is no, the, the most, you know, the, the only polarization is, is be, I have seen people working with optical regimes. I'm, you know, you can have kind of, back, I guess, you know, with, with radio data, you, people do things that probably have face information, but I'm not aware of, of any development. And it's not an area that I have done a lot of any work at, at all, actually. I see phase. I mean, people have shown that phase is extremely important. Uh, it, 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 it does include, you know, vast amounts of information if you can get it. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm not, I'm not sure, but yeah, no, I'm special sensors. You know. Because these are, you know, I don't know if maybe some versions that are like radio, multispectral, you know, or microwave that they, they probably have, they can take advantage of other characteristics. And if you're doing active probe, maybe, but I really not. Only, you know, and I've seen people doing polarization, and I know, I think Michael was doing some polarization measurements as well, so he was doing something different. So, but you know, but we try some very simple ideas, just put polarizers in front of the imager and collect the images. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, what, obviously, the validation problem is, is a big problem, and uh, is there, uh, do you guys have anything that perhaps that you can use as a, uh, as kind of a token of calibration, where you know exactly the composition, for instance, of the material, yeah. and, then, and then you work, you basically apply your algorithm off of that and see how it, you know, uh, it performs, and use that as a sort of a means of calibrating for whatever class of yeah. other images you run. Well, when we talk about cali uh, calibration, there is radiometric calibration, and normally they put targets with the. Uh, Known spectral characteristics to convert the data to reflectance or radiance unit. In, your, in what you're saying, I, I have seen a couple of data sets. I have to say I haven't played with them. Uh, but Rochester Institute of Technology, for instance, they they, they literally build these big uh, panels that literally have many panels with specific mixing ratios, and they big, they, big, they build them big enough so they will compose. There will be several pixels on, a, on an image. Uh, and I have, some people have tried to do that, but I haven't played with those specific data sets myself. I haven't had a chance to deal with those. The validation is a, I mean, it's a big problem. It's, it's because, you know, there, there are simulation tools, and actually very good ones. There is a tool called DIRSIG, which is widely used by many in the defense, by the defense, people who are working on defense data. And it's a very good simulation tool. But, but you know, it's, it's hard to, to be able to build good validations here. That's why we try to use the classification as a proxy, as an indirect proxy, because we knew that if something was classified to be certain class, we expect at least the abundance of, of whatever material in that particular pixel to be very large. So we, that's why we were looking at classification as an indirect way to, to do this. Yes. When you talked about uh, the separation problem, you say that IK is not applicable clearly because they are not independent anymore. The sum of them is one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, do you think that you can assume any other kind of statistical assumption? There are approaches who are, who are statistical in their approach to mixing. Uh, we just talk to the geometric ideas because, right. you know, per, I guess personal preference. Okay. But, but they are, they are in, they're imposing, you know, all sorts of different distributions and Dirichlet distributions for the abundances. And they are doing different statistical assumptions, Bayesian, you know, Markov random fields and things like that. So there are people who are exploring more of that uh, statistical approach. We, we stuck to the geometrical ideas to, to do our work, just because, in a way, because we like those better. Yeah, there are some comparison works. And 
you know, but again, we go back to the same point. Uh, uh, it's hard to really be able to validate these products because of the lack of really good ground truth. In. So, uh, so you get better or worse pictures or things that make more sense than others, but you still always have that uncertainty and it may not be exactly the truth. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you all.